Right, good morning everyone once again. Uh, welcome to session two. If you were here on Tuesday, uh, you would have been in session one of mine, which was uh, evolution. In this session, we're going to deal with reproduction. Um, and I see already there's a mistake on my PowerPoint. It should be human reproduction. So um, there's a few things I want to try and do today, uh, starting with the structure and the function of the male and female reproductive system. Um, this session will be a lot more interactive, so I would like to ask teachers if um, I give the activities. If you could please um, ask your learners to, to do them. And if there is uh, any questions, they they can access me or or you can access me through Teams. Just raise your hand or they can send a message through the WhatsApp line. If you are not here on Tuesday, you will not know me. My name is Mr. Lambrechts. I will be your tutor for this morning for the next two hours as I was on Tuesday. So if I can ask, uh, I will be focusing a lot on questions, uh, briefly on concepts. And if you guys have any specific question or any specific concept that you would like me to go through with you, besides what I'm going to go through, please do just uh, ask your teacher to unmute or to or you yourself can just uh, message through the WhatsApp line. All right. If you guys are ready, what you need to have in front of you is one, a piece of paper. I'm sitting with my exam pad just so to jot down anything you guys might ask. And if you could please have a pen with you, you would also need, I am sure your teachers have given you, is your revision booklet. So if you just uh, focus on where I'm going to go, it is this booklet that looks like this. OK, so it says Life Sciences Revision Booklet um, 2. I'm going to be doing a few questions out of this. If you can have this in front of you, um, I'm sure your teachers gave it to you. If you don't have it, uh, that's fine. I will um, display anything that I will do so you will see it on the screen. OK, and then the second thing you need to have with you is the second booklet, which looks like this. It says Vertebrate and Human Reproduction. And this is also revision questions compiled by Mrs. Fortain from Metro North. And I'm going to be going through this as well. OK, so you need those four things in front of you or those three things, pen, paper, um, and then these two booklets. And then obviously, as I speak, please do take notes. Um, we see every end of year when we mark the national paper one, um, learners do make a lot of mistakes when it comes to human reproduction. So please do listen to what I'm about to tell you. OK, so I'm going to assume that you guys are all ready and I'm going to jump straight into it. And uh, yeah, I do hope you enjoy it. And as I said, please let me know if you have any questions. So let us get started. Um, two things here. Sorry, there's one more thing you need to have with you. It's your exam guideline. OK, so I'm going to start there. If you look at your 2021 exam guideline, which you or your teacher would have provided for you, OK, this will be your bread and butter for life sciences, specifically what to study. OK, so I'm just going to scroll down to get to human reproduction. You'll see if you scroll all the way down, you'll get to it over here and you'll see it's in paper one and it's 41 marks. That is quite a lot of marks out of 150. And this is the type of uh, content that you can get marks if you just focus on um, what you know. Um, it's the type of work that if you study it by heart, they will ask it to you as it is. OK, so we're going to start with the structure of the male and the female reproductive system, and then we're going to go to puberty, which is what you've learned in grade nine, I believe. And then two extremely important uh, concepts will be um, o, um, o genesis, and then obviously as well spermatogenesis, which is asked quite frequently, OK, specifically o genesis. So this is what I'm going to highlight because you'll see this coming up in a second. OK, so just focus on that for me. And if I was you as well and I was a learning grade 12 and I had my exam guideline, I would highlight what the sir is showing me to highlight. And that is the second thing you're going to highlight there out of your exam guideline. OK, dealing with gametogenesis. So before we get there, let's speak about the structure of the male and the female reproductive system. OK, um, you have to know your labels for this, and I'm sure you guys have done this before, so I'm not going to reteach it. I'm just going to revise it. So here we are looking at the male reproductive system, and you will see um, on the top hand side, I just want to try and just get this away. There we go. You will see I have put here that it's in MTG. This is Mind the Gap, figure 4.1 on page 19, knowing the labels of the male reproductive system. They will ask you to label either the male or the female reproductive system, and you have to be able to do that. OK, so let's go into it quickly. 
recapping what you guys should know. Let me just move this probably over the on top. OK, so you need to know a whole bunch of labels. You're not all of these labels, just the most important ones. OK, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. And because this is work that you guys have done, I'm just going to mention a few and then I'm going to give you an activity to start out with just to see what you know. It's not for marks. Um, it's not uh, for as I said for marks, but I would like you to just do it. And then um, if you could do it and if I could ask maybe a school just to give me the answers if they are brave enough. And as I said, I don't have a reward, but I can give you give you bragging rights. OK, so let's quickly look at a few labels here. You have the bladder. We know the bladder is obviously responsible for storing urine. Um, you have if you come down this way over here, you have the glands of the penis, which we know we're going to learn in a few minutes as well. You have the urethra opening, which is where urine as well as semen, and we know semen is sperm and fluid, would exit the penis. You have the testis here at the bottom. We know there's a very important process that happens there. Um, that it's the process of how sperms are made. I'm going to get to that later. We have the scrotum, which I will also focus on in a, in a short bit. And the scrotum has to do with temperature regulation. OK, and the scrotum is a typical higher order question. What does that mean? It means they're going to ask you this in terms of a scenario. And you will see that I'm going to do one of those questions a bit later. OK, I highlighted the testers. That is where your sperm is produced. Then you have what we call your epi epididymis. Um, when we'll speak about that a bit later, that's the sperm duct, the vas deferens, um, and then your glands, okay, corpus gland, the prostate gland, and the seminal vesicles, which is on top. And this is just some of the labels that you guys have to know of by heart. All right, and I highlighted the bladder as well. Now, because this is work you have done, okay, you have done this work before, and I assume you've done it before, I'm going to put up this diagram. And just give you, let's say, one or two minutes. There is this one, and there is one after this as well, for you to just fill in the function of the white blocks that I've blocked out. So I've given you a few there. I give you the function of the ureter. I give you the function of the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, and the carpal gland. Please fill in for me the function of the bladder, the function of the um, ejaculation duct, and the function of the ureter as well. I'm going to give you guys exactly about two minutes to do that quickly for me and then we're going to see what you get right okay so please do that now for me please on your own on a piece of paper so setting my timer You can if you want to just write in keywords if you don't know the full sentence, but yeah, full sentences are important. So just write in what you think the functions of those three um, labels are that I've blocked out. We have about 20 seconds, then I'm going to just reveal it. So about five seconds and you should put your pens down right about now. OK, there's my timer. So. Let's quickly see if you got these functions correct. And let me just move this little thing down this way. So for the you for the bladder, let me just do this quickly. There we go. It stores urine. OK, so if you just hit stores urine, that would be correct. That's one more there for the next one. That would be to eject semen along the urethra to the outside or semen um, to be rejected, uh, to be ejaculated out of the penis. That would be correct as well. Remember, not sperm. OK, very, very important. It's not to eject or ejaculate sperm because we know that it's not only sperm that leaves the penis. It's also other fluids and the fluid plus the sperm gives you semen. OK, and you have to say the word semen I mean, not sperm. And then lastly, the urethra. Um, that would be to carry urine and semen to the outside or to carry urine and semen to the outside of the penis. That would also be correct. OK, and once again, the keyword here, grade 12 is semen. 
not sperm. OK, so please make sure you do use the correct terminology. It's semen, not sperm. Let's see how you do the next one. The next three, the vast difference, the epididymis and then the scrotum. They're going to give you another minute and a half or two minutes for this one. So let's put my timer on starting now. So let's see what the vast difference. Uh, that would be the transport sperm cells by peristalsis from the testis to the urethra. OK, once again, notice the terms I'm using. It's to transport sperm now. OK, remember in the testis is where the sperm is produced. We call that process spermatogenesis, meaning the production of sperm. And the sperm is then transported from the testis, OK, um, via peristalsis to the urethra. And we're going to get to that what happens next day. Um, the function of the epididymis, that would be to store sperm cells. OK, so it um, stores it for, uh, for a short time and it also is responsible for ripening of the sperm cells. So if you say temporary sperm or sorry, temporary storage of sperm, you are correct. And also the secretion, uh, the peristalsis and helps the movement of sperm. OK, so any uh, one of these that would be correct. So one for that sentence and one for that sentence, you would be correct for the epididymis. They love to ask this in the end of the year papers, so make sure you know the function of the epididymis. We know the testis is where sperm is produced by the process called spermatogenesis, and I'm going to look at it a bit later. And we also know the testis produces testosterone, and testosterone is an extremely important hormone, um, which we know is responsible for secondary sexual characteristics in males. What is secondary sexual characteristics? It's stuff like males growing taller, the voice getting deeper, um, shoulders broadening out, um, and muscles developing. OK, that is secondary sexual characteristics in males. We look at puberty in a, in a short while. And then finally, the scrotum. The function of the scrotum would be to regulate temperature. OK, temperature is important when it comes to the, the production of sperm, which you'll see later. So you must be able to say the scrotum is responsible for regulating temperature, not pressure. OK, and um, you must be able to explain how it does it and why it does that. OK, and I'm going to get into that a bit later, how the scrotum regulates temperature. And then finally, the penis transfers the sperm to the vagina of the female, and that is where fertilization and pregnancy will follow. OK, so let's talk about the scrotum. Excuse me. So the first thing we need to understand about the scrotum is that it regulates temperature. OK, how it does it is in a fascinating way, which I'll get into in a second. So we know before birth, the testis moves through a canal to hang outside of the abdominal cavity in the scrotum. The abdominal cavity is basically the body. OK, so that the, the um, testis needs to hang away from the body in something called the scrotum in the males. And that happens so that it can regulate the temperature and the reason it has to regulate the temperature is because sperm is temperature sensitive. OK, when I say it's temperature sensitive, it means that the optimal temperature for sperm development has to be less than body temperature. Now, I'm sure if I ask you guys what is the body temperature, we would all agree it is 37 degrees Celsius, more or less, and that is too high for sperm to be produced. So whenever the testis is at body temperature. It's too high for sperm to be produced. It's not optimal. And therefore, the scrotum keeps it at a one or three degrees less than the abdominal cavity, which is your body temperature. So if we look at 37, we're looking at about 35 um, or 34 degrees. That is how sperm will be um, optimally to be um, produced optimally. OK, then we obviously know that in cold weather, so how, how does it do it? Okay, in cold weather, when your body's cold, the muscles in the scrotum will contract and they will then press the testis closer to the body so that the testis can get more heat. That is in cold weather, okay? And the boys are always joking, class. The boys will tell you um, what happens if they swim in the ocean or into a cold pool, what happens to that scrotum um, in cold weather or cold water, okay? They contract and it actually moves closer to the body and so that it can receive more heat from the body. OK, in warm weather, um, the muscles will relax and that moves the testis away from the body. OK, because it's too warm. And again, the boys, they will say what happens after they've taken a bath. 
OK, what happens to that scrotum? It hangs away from the body and that's because it's keeping it at this optimal temperature of one to two degrees less than the body temperature. OK, and this uh, grade 12 is an extremely popular question. It comes up almost every year. So please ensure that you know and that you understand how the scrotum regulates the temperature of the body. OK, obviously, if this did not happen, OK, let's say the scrotum did not um, move closer to the body or the scrotum did not move away from the body when it's warm, then you're going to have abnormal sperm being developed. And we'll see in the questions how we're going to write that. But basically, if it doesn't happen, then sperm will be abnormal. It doesn't kill sperm. OK, okay sorry. You can't say it kills sperm or that there's no sperm. It's that there's abnormal sperm. There's still sperm being developed, but the sperm is abnormal. You can't say there's no sperm. That would be incorrect. But we'll get to that when we get to the questions. OK, and this is just a picture of the sperm cell. OK, um, this is a normal sperm cell, obviously. Very important here in Mind the Gap, figure 4.4 on page 20, if you have the Mind the Gap textbook. This picture you need to be able to draw in the exam as a sperm cell. OK, you would see in the corner here it says draw because I always tell my learners learn to draw this. And it's drawing and labeling for about six marks. And this is a bread and butter uh, mark question grade 12. You should get this quite easily. If you draw your sperm cell at the top, the head of the sperm cell, we refer to the very top as the acrosome. And they can ask you just to label it or they can ask you for the function of that and we know the acrosome contains enzymes that dissolves the outer layer of the egg so that the sperm can penetrate the egg then you have the head there you have the nucleus and we know the nucleus contains your haploid set of chromosomes if i can ask very quickly how many chromosomes will be in this nucleus who wants to tell me how many would it be 30 would it be 40 maybe 100 how many chromosomes would be in here roughly What do you guys think? Is it 40 chromosomes, uh, 25, uh, 100? Let me know. OK, so that will contain chromosomes. Then here in the middle part of the sperm cell is the is the mitochondria. And why this mitochondria is to provide energy that is needed by the tail for the sperm to obviously swim and to meet the egg. And we call that process fertilization. OK, so very important that you, that you label this, um, draw it and label it. And we're going to get back into this in a second. OK, here's just another picture of it. OK, just to show you a bit more detailed. There's the acrosome over there. There's the nucleus that's going to contain an amount of chromosomes. I will, won't give it away yet. There's the neck. There's the middle piece where the mitochondria is. And then there's the tail of the sperm cell as well. OK, now everything I just mentioned, uh, grade 12, is in this revision pack. OK, I'm just going to go down to the human reproduction part, um, which is further down over here. OK, so if you go down here, you will see um, it says human reproduction. I am on page. What page is this page eight? OK, and you will see that there is a nice diagram given to you taken from Mind the Gap. So if you go to Mind the Gap, you will see on page 19. I'm in the Mind the Gap textbook now on page 19 is the diagram that is shown in your revision booklet. And please make it important for yourself to study this diagram. OK, this diagram is your bread and butter, meaning they will ask you almost exactly like this to label. And if you can do that, you will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, possibly eight marks for labeling. And then if they ask the functions, you're looking at a little bit more marks over there. OK. Um, here is what I spoke about now, the sperm cell. If it's easier for you to study this diagram, fantastic. You can use this diagram to study the sperm cell, OK, learning to draw it and to label it. I can almost guarantee grade 12s that they're going to ask you to either draw it or to label it. Um, so that's important. And then we're going to get into the female reproductive system in a minute. OK, so what I want you guys to do very quickly is I'm going to give you a few minutes uh, now to quickly work on this on your own. You can ignore question one. OK, so let's not do question one. And I want you to quickly see, just to test if you listened, you can do question two for me, question three, uh, question four as well, and then question five. 
Okay, just to test what you know and just to test if you have been listening. I'm going to give you exactly, let's see, that is three, that's seven, that's ten. Um, I'm not going to give ten minutes. I'm going to give you five minutes or so to just quickly do that. Okay, so if you can do that for the next five minutes, so just answering question two, three, four, and five, and you can use um, the handout I gave you, or not I gave you, but the teacher gave you, or you can use Mind the Gap um, to answer it as well. Okay, so I'm going to start my timer, and I'm going to just quickly check in if there's any questions, and if someone answered my question on the amount of chromosomes there is in a sperm cell, but you guys can start with this right about now. On your own, please, and I'm going to give you guys five minutes to just do that quickly. If there's any questions, please do ask. OK, so just remember you're not doing number one. You start at number two. OK, so number two, three, four and five for the next five minutes. Please, I'm going to leave that up. There my timer goes. So let's see how well you guys did. Remember, um, this is only to see if you've listened and also obviously to see what you guys know already. So I'm going to put the answers up. Remember, you only mark from question two until five. You can ignore question one. And let me know how many of you guys got right. So from question two only, the organ where sperm is produced is the testis. Or where testosterone is produced. And then you can just mark the rest over there. So if there's any questions um, on this, please do let me know if you guys aren't clear. What I will just quickly mention is question five. It's the nucleus, the role of the nucleus. Remember, the nucleus has 23 chromosomes. If you thought that, um, you would be correct when I asked you how many chromosomes are in the nucleus of the sperm, and that's a haploid number. And we know those 23 chromosomes will fuse with the nucleus of the egg, which also has 23 chromosomes, and that's going to give you uh, 46 chromosomes and we call that the zygote okay and that is obviously 2n over the okay um it's important grade 12s uh, no use the marking i just want to mention that you understand how the chromosome number works between the sperm and the egg they ask that a lot and a lot of learners get it wrong um for the sperm individually meaning the sperm cell will have 23 and the egg cell has 23 and when they combine they give you 46 okay at the end so it doesn't start with 46 as is the common mistake um remember it's only 46 after the sperm and the egg have fused then you get 46 chromosomes which will be a zygote all right and that is the first half of or the first quarter of our session done i'm going to move on to the female reproductive system if anyone is still busy here, please let me know now. Otherwise, I'm going to assume you guys are done and I can move on. OK, I see nothing from anyone, so I'm going to move on to the next part, which is the female. OK, so besides the male reproductive system, there is some things you need to know about the female. Remember now what we did with the male reproductive system. It was the headings or the labels. It was the sperm cells, how to draw it. And then at the end, it was the role of the scrotum. And those are the three things, grade 12, if nothing else sticks in your head when you're studying, let those three things stuck. OK, how to label, um, how to draw a sperm cell and then label it as well, and then the role of the scrotum. Okay, let those three things stuck because those are the three things that are often asked in paper one when we mark these papers every year. We're going to move on now to the female reproductive system, um, and I'm going to mention a few things here as well. With the females, we know, again, labels, 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 labels. Okay, both males and females, has the labels are important. And I just want to get my laser point up here. There we go. And just to mention a few labels here, we're going to speak about the ovary a bit later when we do um, oogenesis, the production of ovaries. So being able to label the ovary, a woman has two, one on the left, one on the right. 
And then you have the fallopian tube. It's where the sperm swims up to to meet the egg. So remember now, the ovary will produce the egg. Okay, every every month, once a month for a female from the onset of puberty until about 50 years old or when she reaches menopause, one, or one egg will be produced. One month it will be on this side of the um, system and then the other month it will be this ovary. So it alternates between left and right. Um, the ovary will then be released and you can see the, if you look closely with my laser pointers now, that is the release of the ovum, okay? And the release of the ovum is known as uh, ovulation. And we're gonna speak about ovulation and menstruation in quite detail today. And then that over that ovum will now move upwards over here, the release here, and the, the sperm cell swims up to meet it over there, okay? So that's the fallopian tube. Then if you come down the fallopian tube, you will have your endometrium. So this whole organ here, first of all, is the uterus. And then in the uterus, you have your endometrium and notice where the label is. The endometrium is the outside layer. So with my laser pointer showing you, that's the endometrium or the, the innermost layer, if you want to look at it that way. And then you have your myometrium, which is the muscle part of it. Okay. And then you have the uterine cavity, which is the hollow part. Now the endometrium, the myometrium and the uterine cavity is the uterus. So this whole thing is the uterus. But if they show you to label this part where my laser pointer is, you cannot say that's the uterus. That will be incorrect. OK, that's going to be the endometrium. So you have to be very, very careful when you label this. Notice where the label stops. So if the label stops right there. That is the endometrium. And if the label stops before that, so here with the muscle is, that is the myometrium. And if you write endometrium, incorrect. OK, so that's key to understand grade 12 where the label stops. OK, and then you have your cervix over here. And obviously where it's number eight and nine, that's the cervix. And then this is the vaginal opening over here. And we're going to look at this in a second. OK, um, so what do you know of the female reproductive system? This is one, two, three, four marks. I'm going to give you two minutes, so half the time to quickly see if you can label number one, two, three and four. Um, let me start my timer. So I'm going to give you guys exactly two minutes for this um, just to see what you now know of the female reproductive system. So just write number one, the answer, number two, answer, three, answer, number four, answer. Your time has started. You have about a minute and 45 seconds. Right, so let's see how many you get right. Obviously, grade 12 biological terms is absolutely critical, meaning you have to know them and they can ask you any amount of biological terms in paper one. I just put up a few. Um, so let's see how many you got right. So the first one says the inner lining of the uterus. And remember, I showed you now the two linings. I'm just going to go back quickly. Remember, here we go. This is the uterus over here. And I showed you now the inner lining is the endometrium and then the muscle part of it is the myometrium. So let's see, that would be the endometrium. So if you wrote endometrium, you were listening and you would have that correct. Number two is the tube that connects the ovaries to the uterus. Let's just see what that tube looks like. Uh, just go back for me. Here we go. So the tube that connects the ovaries, which is here, to the uterus, which is there, and we're looking at this tube over here. So that would be the fallopian tube, right? And number three is the structure that produces the female hormones. That would be an easy one. That is the ovary or the ovaries. If you're not ovaries, plural, that's fine. And then number four is the part where development of the embryo or the fetus normally takes place. And that would be the uterus. OK, because it's the middle part. Let me just go back quickly. Oops, there we go. That would be here and that would be the uterus. OK, if you said uterine cavity, no, because we know the blastocysts were implanted in the endometrium. So it can't be the uterine cavity. It's the whole organ and the whole organ here is the uterus. OK, so it's that hollow part over there. And yeah, that is it for the female system. OK, so once again, textbook uh, mind the gap. If you want to look at that, knowing the labels is key there. I went through that already. Um, and I'm not going to go through this now with you or rather I'm not going to ask you to do it. I'm just going to show it to you quickly because we are pressing for time. 
So again, knowing the labels, just as you do with the male part, and I can't tell you if they're gonna ask you the male or the female, you have to know both, okay? And this is some of the most common labels over here. And for the ovaries, we know the ovaries will be the part where all genesis takes place and the maturation of the primary follicle to a graphene follicle and the release of the egg or the ova. That is what happens in the ovaries. And also, excuse me, the um, secretion of estrogen and progesterone, which we'll do later. OK, that is the function of the ovaries. The fallopian tube, we just did this now. The fallopian tube is responsible for fertilization. That's where fertilization takes place. They love to ask where fertilization takes place. It is not, I repeat, it is not the uterus. OK, so a lot of learners write fertilization takes place here. Great powers, that is incorrect. OK, fertilization does not take place here. It takes place here in the fallopian tube and then the egg moves down and it implants here. And that is where the fetus grows, not where fertilization happens. Common mistake in paper one. Um, so that's where fertilization takes place in the fallopian tube. Um, and that's also where the development of the zygote will develop into an embryo. You would remember there you have the um, zygote which is going to grow into a ball of cells and the name of that ball of cells is important is called a morula and that will then grow further and further into a blastocyst okay and you have the uterus as i showed you now and the uterus is the implantation of the blastocyst or the embryo and that's where the embryo develops into a fetus it also maintains pregnancy it assists in childbirth and, it's, and it, is, it is the passage for sperm between the vagina and the fallopian tube as well. It also protects the fetus, okay, and prevents infection. So there's a lot of things that you, you can mention here, but implantation of the embryo maintains pregnancy or any one of those would be correct. Okay, then just finally, the, the last part is the birth canal of the female, um, allows a passage of blood and the endometrial lining and facilitates sexual intercourse and receives the semen does not receive sperm. OK, I'm going to just highlight this again, grade 12, OK? Um, you need to understand that semen is what is released, not just sperm. So the uh, angina will receive semen, does not receive sperm. Remember that. It's also the birth canal, and then it secretes an acid that prevents infection. OK, and that is the labels, the first few labels there. OK, for the female. Now, as I said, grade 12, you can be asked any one of these, so please make sure or ensure that you know um, these labels. This is the most common ones. And just when you're writing on this, make sure that you use the correct words like semen instead of sperm and um, you should be OK. All right. Once again, if there's any questions, if there's anything I have to repeat, you guys are more than welcome to just message on the WhatsApp line or to just ask a teacher to ask a question if you have a question. OK, on the egg or the ovum, you have to be able to draw the egg or the ovum. Um, it's an easy drawing. OK, very easy. You just draw the outer layer. OK, um, then you draw the nucleus and then you label it. So usually it's about three to four marks and the egg starts with the nucleus in the middle. We know that has 23 chromosomes. And then you can um, highlight this inner part over here, which would be um, the egg cytoplasm. If you write cytoplasm, we'll accept it. So you, you draw your nucleus and then you draw the outer layer. So you just draw two circles and then you label it. OK, nucleus in the middle, the egg cytoplasm over there. And then if you want to label or draw this extra layer over here, we call it the zona perm lucida. And that would be the outermost layer over there. That's what the sperm breaks through, the, the zona um, pellucida. OK. Um, this drawing is easy, grade 12, it's brilliant, but the once again, you shouldn't struggle here. So they can either ask you to draw the sperm cell and label it, or they can ask you to draw the egg cell. And this is the simple drawing of the egg cell and label it. OK, then the last thing I'm going to speak about before I give you a little break or before we go into just a, a quick stretch break is the process of gametogenesis and meiosis. OK, now gametogenesis, as the word implies, is obviously the formation of gametes. Gametes is important to understand here. What is a gamete? A gamete is a sex cell. OK, what is a sex cell? Sperm and egg cell. Those are your two gametes when it comes to reproduction. And they are formed through meiosis, not mitosis. They are formed through meiosis. So 
we know that at puberty, okay, the, pro, the um, gametogenesis is the process by which meiosis forms gametes, um, and we know that will happen um, during the process of gametogenesis where the haploid sperm or ova is produced as a result, and a diploid zygote forms um, when the nuclei of the two cells, meaning the egg and the sperm when they fuse, and they call that fertilization. Now, I'm just going to go very quickly to um, your handout, which is over here. OK, so if I'm now in this handout, which will, has been provided for you, I just now did the structure of the female reproductive system. There you see the picture over there. If you don't have this handout and you go to Mind the Gap, you just scroll down a bit further and then you will see in Mind the Gap, there is a diagram of the female reproductive system over there. OK, and you can study that as well. We just did this now. Um, then you'll see there's something on puberty, and that's why I want to stand still for just a minute or so. Um, there's a drawing of the egg cell. You have to be able to define puberty. Now, I know your teacher might have just briefly mentioned it because it's something you have done in grade nine, I believe, but they will ask you to either define puberty or, or give the differences in puberty between males and females. So let's see what puberty is. Puberty is the stage when secondary sexual characteristics. Now, what are these things? Secondary sexual characteristics, such a big word. Um, it's stuff like, as I said, in males, it's the beard, it's the deep voice. Um, in the females, it's menstruation, it's developing, um, or rather it's it's development of breast or, or hips widening. Okay, and in males, it's the voice and the broader shoulders. And in both males and females, it's the maturation of the sexual organs, okay? And if you go to Mind the Gap, Mind the Gap will give you just a little table to explain puberty in males and puberty in females. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this. I want to mention the first um, two columns here, stimulated by testosterone and stimulated by estrogen. So males have testosterone and females have estrogen. We know that. And we know that is going to be what the hormones that kick in at puberty. We're going to see why those two hormones are so, so important. Um, in this handout, as I said, you have to explain what um, puberty is. And then we know that puberty will drive the development of sperm cells, and we call that spermatogenesis. And it will also drive the development of ova or egg cells, and we call that oogenesis. Okay, and you guys need to know those two definitions. Spermatogenesis and oogenesis is extremely important. And besides that, you have to tell us what is spermatogenesis and what is oogenesis. And you will see if I just quickly go to um, the guideline. The guideline clearly states there how, what it is. OK, so there is the definition of the development of sperm, spermatogenesis, under the influence of testosterone. Diploid cells in the seminar or semi forest tubules will undergo mitosis or meiosis, my apologies, to form haploid sperm cells. Just those three bullets and oogenesis, a bit more detailed. Diploid cells in the ovary undergo mitosis first um, to form numerous follicles at the end or at the onset of puberty. Those numerous follicles will then be, um, that process is controlled under the influence of FSH. We're going to speak about that in a second. It's called follicle stimulating hormone. Okay. And one cell inside the follicle will enlarge and undergoes meiosis. Um, of the four cells that are produced, only one will survive to form a mature haploid ovum and, or secondary oocyte, and this occurs in the monthly cycle that's called the ovarian cycle. So, grade 12, please, please, please study this section and this section just as it is out of the exam guideline. They ask this every single year. Okay, and I've highlighted it here as well in your revision handout. Um, the process of oogenesis is there, and the process of spermatogenesis is briefly described over there. Okay, um, let me just do this quickly. I have about two minutes on the section before I give you guys a break. So um, here is just a diagram um, image of it. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but all you need to know here is that the oogonium, it will, it will undergo meiosis to form a primary oocyte, one of it will become the ovum, and then one of, a, one of it will become a polar body. Okay, we know that is the ovum that's going to be fertilized, and that is going to be um, haploid, and haploid will give you a diploid ovum. Okay, this where it says this is the state of the egg before being fertilized. 
It's called a secondary oocyte. You also get a primary oocyte, which is there, but the secondary oocyte is well, is the state the egg is in before it's fertilized. All right. Um, then this is just a very a, a diagrammatical image of the production of sperm or, or what we refer to as spermatogenesis. Once again, I'm not going to go through it. You just study it as it is in the guideline. Okay. Um, this is just again a reminder of the sperm cell, what you need to know for the sperm cell to draw it, to label and to draw it and the functions. And once again, this, that's just another reminder of the sperm cell over there. Okay, I'm gonna, I put up this question here before we were supposed to take a break, but I'm gonna be pressed for time. So what I want to do is just focus quickly on question eight. Um, these questions you can look through when I give you the break in a minute. But let's just go on question A to see how can these questions be asked. OK, so on your revision booklet, uh, life science revision booklet, if you go to question eight, which will be at the bottom, if I'm not mistaken. Let's just go all the way down. Here it is as well. OK, so um, I'm going to leave up question eight. In fact, I'm going to um, let you go into a stretch break now for 10 minutes, but it should be five minutes. But if I can ask the teachers to just monitor for me, please. Um, I want you guys to do question eight. OK, where is question eight? It's in the revision booklet on page. Uh, let's just go see page 26 and page 25. I'm going to leave this diagram up and I'm going to ask you if you can please answer question eight for me. If I can ask teachers to do it as well, it's a word document, so I can't put up all the questions. But if you can do for me 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, and 8.4, I have done 8.5 for you over there. So that's going to take you about five to 10 minutes. And I'm going to also then give everyone a bit of a breather because I have been speaking for almost an hour. So in this time now, grade 12, it's now 0921. If I can ask you to take a bit of a stretch um, and then to come back and to do this question, I'll look at it at 9.30. I will start again at 9.30 exactly. Um, if you can open this or ask a teacher to leave it open for you and um, please answer 8.1 up until 8.4 and we'll look at the answers when we come back. OK, I'm going to give you guys a break until 0930. Thank you. So on question eight, uh, I asked you to look at this question for me. Hopefully you have and hopefully you've done a few a bit of the, the answers. So let's quickly look at uh, 8.1. OK, so it says the diagram below represents a part of the male reproductive system. And there's the diagram. Now, the first thing you must do, grade 12s, whenever you are given a diagram, let me just minimize this here. The first thing you need to do for yourself is you label the labels in a diagram, even before you look at the questions. OK, so a tip number one, uh, if you get your exam paper for your trial exam or you get your exam paper for um, end of the year, when you have the reading time, especially, OK, try and mentally fill in the labels. That's the first thing you do, OK? Then when you start, uh, when the um, person who is in the exam venue says you can start, then you go and label even before they ask you the labels, OK? So you label D, C, B, as well as A, OK? And we know <clears throat> and E, obviously, over there. OK, so once you do that, it'll be quite easy. So just to go through it and then you'll see they ask it to you here. You have to identify B, D and E. I'm going to go through all of it for you. So number A would be the penis or um, glands of the penis. Number B would be the urethra. I'll open this now to show you guys. Number D would be your prostate gland. OK, number E would be the testis. OK, and number C would be the um, <clears throat> epididymis. So let's quickly go through it. Uh, Where it says identify B, D, and E. So number B, if you identify this correctly, that would be your urethra. Number D, as I said, that would be your prostate gland. And obviously number E, that would be the testis. Okay, so if you got that, give yourself three marks over there. Then it says this, describe the process, okay? happening in E and we know it gives it gives it to you in the question the process of spermatogenesis and as I explained to you if you go to your exam guideline those three bullets you'll see um, in the answer now they ask you these three bullets exactly okay so do yourself a favor grade 12 and study this bullets off by heart okay spermatogenesis 
You write it down exactly as it is here. Three bullets, three easy marks. Let's look at it quickly. So here, let me just remove my text box. It says under the influence of testosterone. Okay, that's the hormone. Diploid cells in the semi um, seminiferous vesicle or tubules of the testis undergo meiosis and they form haploid cells. Okay, so you can study this as it is of the exam guideline. 8.3 says test results uh, show that a man has a low sperm count. Explain why a doctor would advise the man to wear um, underwear that is not tight. Okay, so this is a bit of a high order question and a high order question means you have to apply what you know to an unknown context. Okay, now remember when we spoke about the scrotum, I explained to you they're going to ask you a higher order question for the scrotum and this is one of the higher order questions they can ask you for the scrotum. Now you need to be able to unpack for yourself two things here. Okay, number one is you need to understand if a man has a low sperm count. Okay, obviously the doctor will or the question says explain why the doctor would ask him not to wear tight underwear and you would need to know what will tight underwear do to sperm okay, or to the scrotum. And this is going to bring us back to the point of the scrotum is responsible for temperature regulation. All right. So if the underwear, if a, if a male wears underwear that is tight, that's going to put the scrotum or the testis close to the body cavity or close to body temperature. And we know when the scrotum or when the testis is close to the body temperature, then that's going to have an impact on sperm production. Okay because the sperm has to be at least one to three degrees lower than the body temperature. So the man can't wear tight underwear or he shouldn't wear tight underwear because it's going to put the testers close to the body temperature. And what's going to happen then? You're going to have abnormal sperm developing. OK, and he already has a low sperm count. So jot those few notes down for yourself when you get a question like this. What is the question asking me about which part of um, the male reproductive system. It's the scrotum. How do I know it's the scrotum? Because they're speaking about tight underwear, which will put it close to the body. So here is the answer. Let's quickly look at it. Let me do that. Okay, so you could write the following, and there are two things here. Okay, I'm going to just start with the bottom one, where it says or. Okay, it says when you wear tight underwear, you'll pull the testers closer to the body. That's what I explained to you guys now. And we know when it's close to the body, the temperature will be too high. OK, so I have to mention that the temperature is going to be too high for optimal sperm production. So sperm will not mature and it's going to give you a mark there because the temperature is too high and because sperm does not mature. Let me just delete that. Um, the sperm production will be negatively affected. OK, and that's the easiest marks to get there, as I explained to you guys now that the body, the, the testers will be too close to the body, the temperature will be too high, and therefore sperm will not mature. You're not going to say that there will be no sperm. That's incorrect because there is sperm. Okay, so it's not that there's no sperm, it's that sperm will not mature or the production will be negatively affected. So that has to do with temperature. Okay, the other point which I'll speak about this one over here, this will say that the testers will be further away from the body when you wear underwear that isn't tight. Therefore, the temperature of the testers will be lower than the body temperature, and that will give it successful sperm production. OK, so you can write it in one of these two ways, either saying that the testers will be further away from the body, and it always has to do with the body. Um, and you see there's a mark there, which then means the temperature of the testers will be lower then the body temperature and it has to be okay remember it has to be lower for successful sperm production if it's lower then sperm production would be successful or you could have answered it at this way in the bottom okay question 8.4 speaks about during a vasectomy the vast difference of both the testes is cut so now it speaks about when a man gets a vasectomy explain one reason why a man who has had a vasectomy is still capable of ejaculation. Now you need to remember here, guys, that a vasectomy cuts the vas difference. You need to ask yourself where is the vas difference and um, what happens there. Okay, so we know that when a man gets a vasectomy, the sperm will not go through the vas difference. So there is no sperm, obviously. Okay, but 
they will still be other fluids, okay? So if you wrote anything like this, the fluid part of the semen will still be produced, and that is obviously true because the fluid part of the semen comes from the glands, okay? So let me just go back to the male reproductive system to remind you guys. Here we go. Remember the fluid part of the semen comes from the prostate gland, the corpus gland, and the seminal vesicles, okay? And those will still produce fluid even though sperm will not be present. So because of that, okay, the fluid part will still be produced, and we call those glands the accessory glands, the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, and the corpus gland, and therefore a man is still able, or a man is still able to ejaculate during sexual intercourse, okay? Because there's no sperm, but there is still fluid part of the semen is still present because of the accessory glands. Um, and then let me just delete that. What was the other question here? Explain three structural adaptations for sperm. This is a possible question they could ask. What makes sperm adapted for its function? You can speak about the acrosome there, the nucleus, um, there's many mitochondria, the presence of a tail, and then the contents of the cytoplasm as well as the sperm, it is streamlined. Okay, so you can just come back to the recording, uh, grade 12s, and rewatch it if you answer those questions over there. Okay, I'm going to move on. If there's any other, I am going to move on to the last part, um, which is the menstrual cycle. Okay, I did have these questions here for you guys, but time won't allow us to go through it. But if you can highlight this for yourself, um, just to revise what you've done, question two on page 22 of this revision booklet. This one over here, let me just go there. So vertebrate and human reproduction. If you go to this um, work workbook or booklet, uh, you can you can look at question two, question six, and question seven. Okay, on your own. You're not gonna have a time now during the break. You have you've had a break, but you can go through this on your own and ask your teacher to help you with the with the answers. But this is some of the common questions that I highlighted for you guys to go through. So. There's a few things to understand here, okay? The menstrual cycle and the hormonal cycle. So I put up the picture here of the ovary, and I just want to maybe take this away again. Um, There we go. It's away now. And I've put up this picture of the ovary, okay? Because the ovary is where the ovarian cycle takes place. What is the ovarian cycle? The ovarian cycle is how your the ovary will develop a ovum, okay? And here is the the um, process okay just briefly it starts here by the primordial follicles or the primary follicles which will grow into a secondary um, or a graphene follicle which is over here and inside of that is this little thing that we call a secondary oocyte okay so you will see here's lots of cells here we call them primordial follicles and you will see where my laser pointer is on the inside of them there's a little dot. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. Okay. Now, this process is what I showed you earlier that we refer to as oogenesis. All right. So, if you go study out of your exam guideline the process of oogenesis, this will be extremely easy for you to remember. Okay. So, you're going to study that and then you're going to understand the menstrual cycle. So, the menstrual cycle goes hand in hand with the ovarian cycle, which is the production of an ovum. And then obviously this at the bottom here is ovulation where it releases the ovum. And then this structure over here will be extremely important. It's called the corpus luteum, okay? And the corpus luteum will form after ovulation and it also disintegrates or we can refer to as D and D uh, um, generates. And that is an important process as well which I'll look at now. Okay, so I don't want to give away too much on this picture except to start here. Okay, so here you will see is the menstrual cycle and you are often given a graph like this and it's very confusing if you don't know what is happening. Okay, so let us go through it slowly and let's see what's happening with all these um, different graphs and pictures over here. So the menstrual cycle is controlled by four hormones that you absolutely need to know. The first one, as I mentioned already, is called the follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. Okay, that's the first hormone. The second one is LH or what we call luteinizing hormone. And then you have estrogen and progesterone. So note this down for yourself, grade 12. Know these hormones, one, two, three, four. There are four hormones, okay, and you have to know them. 
then you have to know where each hormone comes from and where it works. All right. So FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, comes from this little part over here, which we call the pituitary gland. Let me just see. There we go. I did put it up here. So you haven't done the brain yet, but I've just highlighted for you that on the base of the brain, there's this little gland. Here. It's about the size of a peanut. We call it the pituitary gland. It has a lot of functions, but we are only going to look at the secretion of FSH and LH. Okay, so FSH and LH come from the pituitary gland. It looks like that. We my laser pointer is now, and that is part of the brain. Okay, so the brain or the pituitary gland is also called the hy hypophysis. That secretes LH, luteinizing hormone, and FSH. Now, when it secretes the hormone, okay, FSH works on the follicle. So FSH goes to the ovary. That's why I put up this picture over here. FSH comes to your ovary, and FSH will be to stimulate the development of primary follicles, and it will stimulate the primary follicles to develop into secondary follicles or graphene follicle, which is the same, more or less the same thing. So that's the function of FSH. It stimulates the development of the fo primary follicles into the graphene follicles. Okay. Then LH, which is luteinizing hormone. Okay, luteinizing hormone also comes from the pituitary gland. It also works in the ovary. Okay, and luteinizing hormone will stimulate ovulation. Right. So if I was you, I would write here in brackets. I'm not going to write with my mouse. It's not pretty, <laughs> but just write in brackets for yourself. FSH will stimulate the primary follicles to graphene follicles. That's why it's called follicle stimulating hormone. And LH, you can write in brackets, will stimulate ovulation. Okay, so LH here works on ovulation and FSH will stimulate the development of a graphene follicle, which we'll look at what, what, the, what that does now. Okay, so two hormones, LH and FH, come from the brain. Where in the brain? The pituitary gland. Okay, so please remember that, guys. And what does LH do? Stimulates ovulation. And FSH will stimulate the follicles. Okay, now when you um, have the follicles being stimulated, you have this picture here of this thing here. This is called a graphene follicle. Okay, and the graphene follicle will now release another hormone called estrogen. Okay, now where is this graphene follicle? I'm going to go back just quickly to this you will see it's here there is your graphene follicle and it just grows bigger and bigger and bigger okay so this is still in the ovary okay so where is estrogen produced in the ovary okay so you can write that for yourself down as well estrogen is produced in the ovary not in the brain please not in the brain in the ovary where does it work it also works in the ovary and we'll see estrogen also plays a role in ovulation but more importantly estrogen plays a role in the development of the endometrium look here at the bottom okay just gonna do this so at the bottom here where i'm making this block that is where estrogen works it allows the uterus line or the uterine lining to become thicker so it thickens the uterine lining okay so that's the, that's the third hormone, estrogen. Where does it come from? It comes from the graphene follicle. But there is my graphene follicle, okay? Then this graphene follicle will now, um, or rather ovulation will happen and it releases the ovum. There you see the ovum, okay? And then you see there's another structure here called the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum is also another structure that's gonna release another hormone called progesterone. So progesterone comes from the corpus luteum, okay? And obviously estrogen also plays a role in development of the graphene follicle or rather LH into the corpus luteum. We're gonna look at that in a second. So let's just recap quickly. Progesterone comes from the corpus luteum. And where is the corpus luteum? It's in the ovary, okay? Estrogen comes from the graphene follicle. There's the graphene follicle over there. Let me just do that. There we go. And where is the graphene follicle? It's in the ovary. Okay. LH or luteinizing hormone, where does that come from? It does not come from the um, ovary. It comes from the pituitary gland, which is this part over here of the brain. So LH comes from the pituitary gland and it works in the ovary. So it works there. It's released or secreted by the brain or the pituitary gland and it acts in the ovary. So it works there. 
And finally, if it's H, where does it come from? It comes from the pituitary gland. And where does it work? It works in the ovary as well. OK, so you need to understand those four hormones. OK, they are absolutely critical and they are the key to understanding how the menstrual cycle works. OK, so I've spoken about the ovarian cycle at length now. OK, so remember here is your primordial follicle and here's your mature graphene follicle over here. OK, so let's just recap for the last time the hormones. OK, so we're going to have um, FSH working here on the follicles. That's going to be the first um, hormone and I'm just going to try and write with my mouse. That's FSH works there. Where does it come from? It comes from the pituitary gland, the little base of the brain. OK, um, that's going to make the, the primary follicle develop into a graphene follicle. Then in the graphene follicle, you're going to have estrogen over here. So that's going to be estrogen. OK, will be secreted by this graphene follicle. OK, and at the same time, LH will also be released. And LH also works here. And this point of the ovary and LH comes from the pituitary gland as well. So let me just write the LH. OK, so LH comes from the brain. If it's H comes from the brain. Estrogen comes from the graphene follicle and the last hormone is progesterone and that comes from the corpus luteum over here. OK, so here is progesterone. Here is estrogen and then here is FSH and here is LH. Now let's see how they work. OK, I'm going to go through the menstrual cycle quickly. Um, I'm just going to put up the sound. Sorry about the sound, guys. There we go. So the follicles which is here so you start here the primary follicles will now grow and grow and grow and grow under the influence of fsh okay remember fsh works here fsh they grow into a mature graphene follicle where's the graphene follicle sir it is this thing over here okay the graphene follicle will now produce estrogen okay and what does estrogen do estrogen will now stimulate ovulation okay and the, the it will um, help the endometrium to become thicker. So estrogen will make the endometrium become thick. OK, and because estrogen, estrogen is released, ovulation will happen. And at the same time, estrogen is released. LH is released as well, which is the luteinizing hormone. So LH is released and that stimulates estrogen or sorry, it stimulates ovulation. So LH works on ovulation and estrogen works on ovulation. OK, remember that for me, please. Where does FSH work? It works on the follicles and estrogen works on the ovulation. LH works on ovulation. Then you have this structure you call the corpus luteum and the corpus luteum releases progesterone. And what does the progesterone do? It maintains the uterus lining, so it makes sure it stays thick. So as long as there's a corpus luteum, it stays thick. But as the corpus luteum disintegrates, OK, Progesterone drops and the endometrium will break down, as I'm going to show you guys now. All right. Once again, great hours, please re re um, replay this recording if you guys are getting a bit lost. OK, so let's see what happens in the menstrual cycle. Here is the full menstrual cycle and here you'll see is day one. You start here by day one to day seven and during day one to day seven, the ovaries or new follicles develop and they secrete estrogen. OK, remember what makes the follicles develop? It's the hormone FSH. I'm making sure you use the correct terminology here. OK, so FSH is released and it stimulates that um, ovaries to produce new follicles. Just to show you how it works, I'm going to just go step by step through the, through the hormonal control of it. So here's what happens. Uh, FSH is secreted by the pituitary gland, also called the hypophysis. OK, and you will see now this will sound familiar. FSH then stimulates the development of the primary follicle into the graphene follicle. On which day does this happen? On day one to day seven. OK, so here's the diagram. I'm not going to I'm unable to show both of it at the same time. So you're just going to have to now imagine this diagram or just go back to it um, when you go over the recording. So FSH stimulates the development of the graphene follicle. What will the graphene follicle stimulate? Which hormone? OK, will it be estrogen or progesterone? Graphene follicle will stimulate estrogen. OK, so estrogen comes first. So it stimulates estrogen. And then what will estrogen now do? Estrogen will now 
stabilize the preparation of the uterine wall. What does that mean? It means it's going to make the endometrium become thicker or more vascular and more glandular. Just means it has more glands and it has more um, arteries or veins and that becomes vascular. And because estrogen is secreted, it inhibits, and this is important grade 12, it inhibits FSH. So as soon as estrogen is present, FSH is inhibited. What does the word inhibit mean? It means it stops or it slows down. It means to stop or to slow down FSH. Now, because FSH is inhibited or estrogen inhibits FSH, at the same time, it stimulates LH. Okay, so FSH is inhibited, so they're going to drop. Let me just make an arrow here. That's going to come down, and that's going to stimulate LH in the pituitary gland, meaning that's going to go up. So LH goes up, and FH comes down. What does LH do now? What important process does LH um, trigger, luteinizing hormone? It triggers ovulation, very important. LH will now trigger ovulation. This is around day 14 of the menstrual cycle. So on day 14, ovulation is triggered, and at the same time, LH stimulates the development of the corpus luteum. And what does the corpus luteum do? The corpus luteum will stimulate progesterone. Okay, so you have to now keep track of the hormones. Okay, then what's going to happen is progesterone will now be responsible for the final preparation of the uterus wall. Remember, grade 12, it does not make it thick. Okay, I'll repeat, progesterone does not thicken the, in the, the wall, it maintains the uterus wall. So the uterus wall is already thick, it maintains it. At the same time, it's going to inhibit the secretion of FSH and the secretion of LH. Okay, so progesterone inhibits FSH and it inhibits LH. Um, and because it, it, it inhibits LH, um, it also is going to stop or inhibit the development of more follicles because what will make the follicles develop? It's the FSH here. Okay, if you go back here, you'll see FSH made the follicles develop. Now, pro pro progesterone stops that process from happening. Okay, then what happens is the corpus luteum will degenerate if it's not fertilized and that will decrease progesterone. So as soon as progesterone decreases, Okay, the endometrium lining will now break down and that's going to initiate menstruation, meaning the breakdown of the of the lining. And because progesterone now decreases, FSH will increase again and the process will basically start all over again. Okay, we call this part over here negative feedback, the inhibiting part. So whenever something inhibits, that's negative feedback and where it stimulates. That's called positive feedback. Where else do you see negative feedback in this diagram? You'll see it at this point over here. Okay, so it inhibits the secretion of FSH and LH, and that's also negative feedback. So it's extremely important, grade 12, to understand which hormone affects the, the other hormone. All of them affect each other, but you have to know that FSH um, or estrogen inhibits FSH, meaning it's a negative feedback and estrogen stimulates LH, that's a positive feedback, okay? And then progesterone, this only inhibits, so this is always a negative feedback. It, it inhibits FSH, LH, and it even inhibits testo, um, uh, estrogen to a, a degree as well, okay? Now, I know that was a mouthful, that was a lot to take in, and I know that it's going to take time for you guys to, to master this, but I just want to go to this diagram to explain how you need to understand it, okay? So based on what I just said now, usually between day zero and day seven, that's when FSH is secreted, there's FSH, and what does FSH do? Remember, FSH will take, will stimulate the development of a graphene follicle. So this over here is your graphene follicle, and that's between day zero and day seven. Because the graphene follicle is there, this is gonna stimulate which hormone? Estrogen, okay, so graphene follicle, will stimulate estrogen. That's why estrogen increases between day 7 and day 14. Okay, so when it increases, it comes from this graphene follicle over there. Um, on day 14, a very important process happens here. This is called ovulation. Okay, now what causes ovulation? LH. Okay, so you'll notice LH is this line over here. LH causes ovulation, and that's why LH increases. 
And you'll notice as LH increases, estrogen increases as well. That's called positive feedback. When the one increases, estrogen is increasing, LH also increases. After ovulation, okay, you're going to have the development of a corpus luteum. And what hormone will corpus luteum um, secrete? Progesterone. So it secretes progesterone. That's why you see progesterone increasing. Why is it increasing? Because there's a corpus luteum. Okay. At the same time, progesterone will now inhibit. Okay. It will now secrete, sorry, not secrete, inhibit um, LH. There you see LH going down. It will inhibit FSH. There you see FSH going down. And it inhibits estrogen. The estrogen is going down. Okay, remember estrogen comes from the graphene follicle. As soon as there's no more graphene follicle over here, there's no more graphene follicle, estrogen decreases. Progesterone increases. Okay, and as it increases, um, if there is the, sorry, as it increases, the endometrium is maintained. So here you'll see the endometrium lining stays thick. Okay, now remember what caused this to become thick? It was estrogen. There you can see estrogen caused the lining to become thick. There it becomes thicker and progesterone keeps it thick. It doesn't um, cause it to become thick. It just keeps it thick. Okay, it maintains it. And if fertilization does not occur, this corpus luteum will disintegrate or degenerate. You can see it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And because it becomes smaller, progesterone drops. Okay, there it's seeing it drops. And because progesterone drops, it's going to break down the uterus lining. I'm now here at this part. Remember, it's a cycle, so it comes back over here. Progesterone drops and the uterus lining breaks down. And because the uterus lining breaks down, FSH goes up. So it's going to stimulate FSH again. And because FSH goes up, um, LH will go up and there will be new follicles forming. And new follicles make a new estrogen. And that goes up and the process basically repeats itself. OK, now that is a mouthful of grade 12 and it's a lot to take in um, on this cold morning, but you guys have done this before. And I just wanted to make sure you guys understand how the hormones work, because when we get to the questions, um, the questions are going to make sense. OK, so this diagram comes from Mind the Gap once again. And if I just go to Mind the Gap um, to show you guys the Mind the Gap diagram um, over here. We can study this on page, let's see, 23 of Mind the Gap. Everything I just explained is clearly stated here. OK, um, there's A, B, C, D, and there is what I explained now for you to go through. It's also written in your um, revision pack. OK, and that's the menstrual cycle. That is the menstrual cycle. Let me just go up to the notes to see if I missed anything. I don't think so. Here we go. It's this whole process here, the, all these bullets here is what I explained now. OK, I apologize if it was a bit long, but yeah, I needed to go through all of that. So let me just highlight that. So there we go. All the bullets are there. OK, let's look at some questions. Let's look at some questions now. So I just wanted to reiterate the menstrual cycle because it is important that you guys understand the menstrual cycle quite in detail. OK, I'm going to ask you to quickly look at this for me on your own now. Um, it is activity three. It's again from Mind the Gap. And I want you guys to just focus on what I explained and to see if you can answer these questions from one to six. I'm going to give you guys, it's about 10 minutes. I'm going to give you eight minutes. OK, so it's going to shave off a few minutes there. So I'm going to give you eight minutes just to go through these questions. I'll leave it up. If you have, um, if you're unclear, you can go back to mind the gap, back to this diagram or in your um, revision pack. But just see if you can apply what I said to these uh, six questions over here. So I'm going to just set my timer. It's 10 marks, but I'm going to set my timer for eight minutes. And let me just uh, give you guys a chance to work through this. Okay. All right, that is my timer. So I'm going to just go through these answers. If you are still busy, I do apologize. But uh, for the sake of time, we're going to move on. OK, so you have a diagram here. Let me just get my laser pointer up. There we go. You have a diagram here that says study figure 4.6 and answer the questions. And it says hormonal control or hormonal regulation of the menstrual cycle. All right. Now, the first thing you need to notice is that you are given the growth of the follicle. OK, 
and you are given the ovarian hormone levels. Now, before you even look at the questions, then I and write in which hormones are going to be here. So if I have a follicle, I know there are two hormones that's going to be present here. It's going to be estrogen. And where does estrogen come from? It comes from the graphene follicle. So it comes from this follicle over here. So that follicle is going to produce estrogen. I'm just going to make it an O. OK, then you have this structure over here. And this structure over here is referred to as the corpus luteum and the corpus luteum will produce progesterone. OK, so when you are given an image like this, uh, write in the hormones first. OK, so estrogen comes from the follicle, the graphene follicle, graphene follicle, and then your progesterone comes from this. So from this side till there, at the end, we are going to deal with progesterone, I'm just going to write a P. And from this side up until ovulation, which is that there, we're going to deal with estrogen. Let's just make that an O. So now we know. OK, and then you'll okay. see. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, there are some answers in the chat box. Oh, fantastic for this question. Uh, yes, I think so, sir. OK, fantastic. I'll ask you now, Asimashle, just to give me the answers as I go through it. Um, I just want to explain quickly, and then you'll see here is uh, um, two uh, lines here, and you have to identify what those lines are. So, so Masley, can you tell me which schools gave you the answers for the first one? You just can choose any one. Um, it's Masibam Bisane. Uh, mm -hmm. So the first, it's estrogen and progesterone. Fantastic, that would be correct. So number one is estrogen and progesterone. And number two now says give an uh, give a reason for your answer. So A would be estrogen, B would be progesterone. OK, so A is estrogen, B is progesterone. What would be a observable reason? OK, it says A, it says it reaches its maximum level before ovulation. OK, it reaches the maximum level before ovulation. Is there an alternative to that? Uh, the, and LH, I'm not sure because they're not numbered. OK, it's fine. So you can just read them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, it says and LH. And LH, OK, let me let me go through it and then we will we will see if those answers are correct. I can tell you the first one is correct. A is estrogen, B is progesterone. Let's see on the number two. So what reason can you give here? Now, the, the, the answer I heard is that it reaches its peak before ovulation. That would be accepted. But if that asks you um, another reason, and that's what I want to get to, the, the second reason would be, where does estrogen come from? Let me just get my razor. Estrogen comes from the graphene follicle. OK, so can you guys see my graphene follicle is here? This one over here. And that makes the estrogen, isn't it? OK, so the observable reason would be the the presence or there is a graphene follicle present, or you could say um, the growth of the follicle because the follicle grows. It goes from small to bigger to bigger to big and then ovulation because of that estrogen is present. OK, because of the follicles. So the correct answer or the most correct answer would be the presence of follicles or the presence of the graphene follicle, because you would know that's the graphene follicle. I would accept also that it reaches its peak before ovulation, but there's another hormone that reaches its peak and that's LH, okay, before ovulation, which I'll get to in a second. So the answer, yeah, I'll show you guys next. Um, in the next slide, you'll see the answers. So what event took place on day 14? Ovulation, one of the learners said that already and well done to you. And that's that process here where my laser pointer is. OK, that's ovulation. Name two other hormones in the cycle. That's what I heard earlier as well. The two hormones here would be LH and FSH. So that's for number four, LH and FSH. You're going to mark now in the next slide. And then it says, I like question five. Did fertilization occur during the cycle in 4.6? Meaning, was the egg fertilized? Is the person pregnant? How do you know if something, if fertilization happened? So number five would be no, no. fertilization did not happen. Um, if someone said yes, I'm going to explain now why it is not so. Uh, and the answer is no. Okay, And the reason is if you look at this structure here, where my red is now, this is the corpus luteum, okay? And the corpus luteum secretes progesterone, and you can see that B is progesterone. Now, when fertilization happens, 
progesterone is maintained, meaning it stays high, it would do this. But because, fertil because um, fertilization did not happen, the progesterone decreases, and your reason here, when they ask you to explain why fertilization, why fertilization did not happen, is because the progesterone decreased. You can see it, okay? And the second reason is the corpus luteum disintegrated or degenerated, and that's why the person is not pregnant, or that's why fertilization did not happen. Okay, and there's the answers over there. So I'm going to leave this up for a few seconds. You can just mark it and see how many you got right. And I want you to post your answers, your score in the in the chat. So if you got 10 out of 10, fantastic. If you got 8 out of 10, fantastic. Um, just post how many you guys got. Um, more or less. OK, but those are the answers. Um, sir, there is a hand up from yep. Nelly. I'm so listening. Nelly, you can just unmute your mic and you can speak. Thank you. Are we having trouble um, getting the mics unmuted? Probably because I did allow for the mic to be. Yeah. I did Can disable you ask the mic. Them to post it in the chat or just to send it through the WhatsApp, and I will come back to this also. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks. I'll move on so for for now, but I will definitely come back and answer that question. Um, okay. Uh, so those are the answers there. If you have marked, so please mark. If you want to know, is this accepted? Is that accepted? I'll let you guys know as well. But let's just move on to some more questions. Okay, right. You guys are going to get to work now. Um, there's three questions I want to do. I will not have time to do all three. And then there were these three other questions I want to do. I will definitely not have time for this. So if I can ask you, I'm going to just stop here for a few seconds. Write these questions down, or you can come back to the um, recording. Please um, go through these questions specifically in your vertebrate and human reproduction revision pack. These are the questions that I or that we commonly see in of the year. So please, if you do nothing else, go through these questions 18, 19, 20, and 23. Um, I'm not going to get to them. I can tell you guys that now I have less than 20 minutes. I have about 12 minutes remaining. And I'm going to try and go through all these three if we have a chance. Okay, if we don't get through them, um, I'm sure your teacher will go through them with you as well. I'm going to end my presentation and go to these questions. I'll wait for the question from that individual. And we are now in this diagram, this revision pack over here. OK, so if you scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. And I think was it that now it was. Here we go. It was this question. So. I want you guys, there's 12 minutes left. Let's see how we're going to divide our time up here most effectively. I want us to work through question one. It's a nice one. Um, as well as I'll skip question two. Um, and I want us to work through question four. OK, so question one and four, I'm going to try and do in the time I have left. Question five is similar to the one I just did. You can do that on your own. But I'm going to focus on question one and in question four, I think I said. OK, so let's go there quickly. And I want you guys to please do this with me um, just to make sure you understand the menstrual cycle and um, the ovarian cycle. So on your learner revision pack, your booklet, you can go here. I am on page 19 of the booklet. You can go here, do question one for me. I'm going to give you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I can't give you seven minutes. I'm going to give you guys exactly three to four minutes, OK? Just to answer question 1.1 and 1.2 from the diagram. And then I'll, I'll look at the answers and it will take you from there. OK, so I'm going to leave this up, but you can look at it in your diagram as well, in your booklet as well. So let's say it's now 20 past. Let's give it until 23 minutes past and then I'll go through the answers. Right, if you are done with 1.1, I'm going to give an opportunity to unmute. I'm going to reveal 1.1. 5.1, gland A is a pituitary gland, and structure B is a graphene follicle, and ben. process C is ovulation, and structure D is copus luteinum. Fantastic. Ovulation, and then structure D is corpus luteum. Fantastic. Okay, so there's the answers. Well done. 
Um, state the effect of estrogen on the levels in the blood gland A if it stops secreting FSH. So let me just um, stand still here for a second. I'm running quickly out of time. I'm watching my time. It's 25 past almost. Um, you guys have now labeled the glands, which is fantastic. And you will see that the gland A will secrete obviously FSH and another hormone that's called LH. OK, um, now remember estrogen comes from what? Ask yourself, why, where does estrogen come from? It comes from the follicles, isn't it? And the follicles would be this over here. So follic for this would be the graphene follicle. And if you, um, if they ask you, what is the effect of the estrogen levels in the blood if gland A stops secreting FSH? So if gland A doesn't secrete FSH, what's going to happen to the follicles? It will not be, it will not grow basically. And because the follicles don't grow, estrogen will decrease. OK, so the levels will remain low or it will decrease. And that's the answer there. And then state one function of LH. What is LH do? I mentioned that it will cause ovulation and it will also cause um, the conversion of the graphene follicle, which is that one to the corpus luteum. OK, so thank you for that. Thank you for interacting with me. I just wanted to touch on that. OK, my apologies for the drilling in the background. I hope you guys can still hear me. I'm just going to move on now because I'm running quickly out of time and get this question over here. Number four. OK, let me just see if this was the one I want to do something else. Yeah, so there's a similar question to what we just did. For those who are a bit confused, you can look at question seven for that one. And I want us to quickly look at number four or for you to look at number four and we'll finish off with this one. So number four has to do with birth control. So if I can ask you guys to just read through number four quickly and then to look at this diagram i'm going to look at, i'm going to keep this diagram up and we'll look at 4.1 4.2 and 4.3 okay i'm going to give you again let's say it's 10 25 i'm going to give you until 10 28 and then we will look at the answers for this one okay please open your revision booklet um and look at number four and then we'll quickly look at the answers for this one okay so just try it and I'm going to do it in the next few minutes. So looking at number four, it has to do with birth control in your booklet. You can read through it. And then I'm going to reveal the answers in about two minutes. OK, we'll just go through this and then we're going to be done. Right, so if you look at this, um, I know you're still busy and I do apologize. We are fast and out of time. This has to do with birth control, OK, or contraceptive. So it gives you a little introduction here. You, you can just read it. This is the um, the contraceptive uh, pills that the person takes. And if you count from Monday to Sunday, you'll count 28. So it's 28 days, OK? And it says the contraceptive pill contains progesterone. Now it gives you a graph and shows you that the individual taking the pills is the solid line. OK, and this shows you the progesterone levels. OK, they test progesterone. And then the dotted line is the person that is not on a contraceptive and it shows you um, the progesterone levels as well. OK, now it says um, there's a few questions here, and I, I chose this because this is what we call higher order questions where you have to think a bit harder and I want to show you how you approach it. So 4.1 says the estrogen levels between day eight and day 22 will remain low in the woman who takes a contraceptive pill. Now, if you look at um, the woman with a pill, OK, you will see that the estrogen, uh, the pro progesterone increases and then it remains sort of the it doesn't go higher than that. So they're talking about that, that it remains that way. Now you must explain why is it that the estrogen now you don't see estrogen here. You only see progesterone, OK? They were asking you about estrogen. Now you might think, how will I know what happens to estrogen? You have to understand the menstrual cycle. So what is the relationship between estrogen and progesterone? You can write this down for yourself. Progesterone will inhibit estrogen. So if there's progesterone levels, then estrogen will be inhibited, OK? So when you explain this, you say the higher levels of progesterone OK, because the levels of progesterone remains there. Let me just highlight that the high levels of progesterone will inhibit the pituitary gland from secreting FSH. We know that. And because there is no FSH, there is no follicle. OK, and because there is no follicle, there can't be any estrogen. So that's why I said make this note for yourself. Progesterone inhibits estrogen 
But the way it does it is that the progesterone inhibits FSH, and FSH can't make follicles, and because there is no follicles, there is no estrogen. Okay, so that's how you would answer that question over there. Then it says uh, ovulation took place on day 14 in the woman not taking contraceptive. What is the evidence? Okay, now you look at day 14, we know that's ovulation. Okay, now you'll see here something is increasing. It's not estrogen that's increasing. What is increasing is the progesterone. Okay, but we know that on day 14, because of that increase over there, the increase in progesterone levels, so you start with that, okay? There we go, we see the progesterone levels increases. Because progesterone increases, we know that the corpus luteum has been formed. All right, and that's the evidence that ovulation took place because there was a corpus luteum. Note that you're not writing about estrogen here. You're writing about progesterone and you're writing about the corpus luteum. And then just lastly, suggest one reason why um, including pills with no hormones are in the packet. So if you look at this one here, the no in the last few ones, there is no pills present. OK, and the reason there is simply that it helps the woman stay in the habit. So woman will stay in the habit of taking the pills every single day. All right. We are out of time, guys, um, and I'm going to steal more of your time. What I do want to ask you to do is the following for me. OK, I wrote down some more questions for you to look at. So if you can just make sure that you work through question one, I did that with you. Question two, I skipped, but you can work through it. And then I did question four now with you guys. So if you can work through question two on your own, and if you can also work through these questions I left open here, and if you don't want to do all four, at least do number 19 and number 20, but try and work through all four um, for yourself, okay? Uh, that was a lot of work to get through in two hours, so I apologize for, for the volume of it, but I hope that it helped you guys. And I want to thank you for your attention this morning and for showing up in the cold. And especially thank you for the individuals, even though I know you couldn't mute your, unmute your mic. Thank you for interacting. And I hope you guys learned at least one or two things that you can take away from the session. Okay, so I'm going to stop there because my time is up. And I want to say thank you and wish you guys all the best with your upcoming trials and your upcoming prelims. If you have any questions, please replay the recording and do ask your teachers because they are the rock stars. They are the, the ones who are with you there. Okay, so thank you guys.